Next time you hear that researchers have made a wonderful breakthrough into nuclear fusion, there's a good chance you're being conned. To be clear, I'm not talking about nuclear fission power. I'm talking about the highly experimental nuclear fusion power. In fission, we split atoms like uranium to get energy, and it's very easy to do. There's 400 nuclear reactors around the world, and they're brilliant pieces of science and technology. But fusion is hard to do. This is where we smash lighter nuclei together. Actually, it's not that hard because this is the same reaction that happens in an H-bomb, and that gives off a huge amount of energy. But I think you'll agree that it's not as controlled as we'd like it to be. So physicists and engineers have been working on controlling fusion reactions since the 1950s, and machines get bigger and better and much more expensive, but there's one thing that hasn't changed. They've been promising that a commercial fusion reactor would be about 30 years away. And then they're likely to say, and hand over a few billion dollars so that we can make a brand new research facility. Actually, it's probably more like $50 billion for the next one. So fusion is like an engine, but unfortunately, after 70 years of research, so far we haven't managed to get this engine to go. But you've got to say that as pieces of science and technology, they are wonderful efforts of human ingenuity. The new international reactor called ITER is the biggest, most expensive scientific experiment ever performed, and it uses as a basis science from all the big name scientists such as Einstein, Maxwell, Boltzmann, you name it. And you just got to love the look of the technology in a tokamak or a, an inertial laser confinement system. The tokamaks make a plasma, which is basically a super hot gas where all the electrons are stripped off the hydrogen atoms. And when I mean hot, I mean properly hot, hundreds of millions of degrees, and co contained in a stupendously high magnetic field and all in a vacuum. And to get that plasma hot, you've basically got to heat it like a microwave oven. Well, a little bit like a microwave oven. Now at those temperatures, you get isotopes of hydrogen, the deuterium and the tritium to form helium nuclei by joining together. And unfortunately, you have to put in huge amounts of energy in the microwaving and all those sorts of things to get the plasma to do uh, what it has to do. And there are a lot of other things that are necessary that require a lot of energy. Now, another way to make fusion is by smashing the nuclei together with incredibly powerful lasers. And that also needs a huge amount of energy input. So the trick is to find a way to get more energy out than you put in, which is essentially what all, energies ha all engines have to do. And this is where we come to the broken science, or at least the broken communication, I think would be a better way to describe it. And I think this is actually pretty shocking and disgusting. Um, in most of the publicity that you see, they actually fudge the numbers to make their research look more successful than it really is. Now that's not broken science strictly, but you can see what I mean. And before I go on, this fudging is really an open secret. It's not like it's hard to fool uh, the average scientific media reporter. So go and have a look on at YouTube videos by, for example, Sabine Hosenfelder and Steve Cribbit, who's been covering this topic for many years. So the trick is this. You ignore a whole bunch of internal efficiencies and overheads in the system. So let's look at an example of the latest ITER reactor, which is being built at the moment. So you can see here that there's the reactor, and let's say that it makes 100 units of heat energy from all that wonderful fusion. And the energy input was 10 units into the plasma of the reactor. And they say, oh, we get 10 times more energy out than we put in. Hooray, we've made fusion work. But at the very best, we're only able to convert maybe 50% of that 100 units of heat energy into electrical energy. So you only have 50 units left. But you have to keep the heaters and the huge magnets going and make that 10 units of energy to input back into the, into the uh, machine. And this is where the big problem comes in. Because of all the inefficiencies, it could easily take 50 units of electricity to make that 10 units of input power to keep the magnets and microwave oven going. 
So you're basically left with nothing as an output in this particular case. That 90 units the reactor made just went into the losses, 50 up here, 40 down there, and that's just basically low-grade heat. This is the ultimate producer of absolutely nothing, and it costs $50 billion. Now, that diagram is actually effectively what is planned for the big ITER reactor being built in France today. In actual fact, it's not really it's not designed to output any electricity at all. But this is what they say. We put in 10 units of input power into the plasma and get out 100 units of energy out of the plasma. Therefore, we've made 10 times more energy than we used. They tell this to the media, skip over the little inconvenient fact that they've ignored all these internal efficiencies in their energy accounting. They do the same with the laser systems. They recently claimed that they got more energy out than they put in with the lasers. For the first time, more energy out than in. They'd made the engine run for the first time in 70 years. Scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. Well, actually not. Because lasers are very inefficient. You can easily put in 10 times more energy into the laser as electrical energy than you get out as laser pulse energy. So in reality, they put in at least 10 times more energy than they could get out as useful energy, probably a lot more actually. So the engine did not run. It sort of span up, it fired a couple of times, and then it stopped. If this was financial accounting, they'd probably end up in jail promising investors something that actually just doesn't add up. And they've been doing this dodgy accounting for literally decades. So 25 years ago, the jet reactor claimed that they, for every 100 units of energy they put into the reactor, they got 70 units out. Not break even, but very good, especially for those days. Except there's one thing, it's not actually true. In reality, they used a thousand units to make the hundred units of energy that they put into the reactor. So they got way less than 10% of the energy back. It was probably closer to 1%. You really need to check out the, the excellent videos by Steve Crivet, who's been blowing the whistle on this uh, for a decade or so. As Steve Krivitt says, this deception goes right to the top. In fact, that's where it is, in fact. And there have been lots of examples of high up uh, scientists and physicists pushing fusion research, funding, making plainly misleading comments. So, for example, for the new $50 billion ITER reactor, when there was a, an inquiry into the with the US Congress, US Congressman Rohrabacher who was clearly a little bit skeptical of this, asked the following. I would love to believe in the dream of fusion energy. I'd love to believe that. And it's very, and it's possible, from what people say, it's possible we will get there. But we know that with the expenditure of the kind of money that we've spent on fusion energy, we could have developed fission energy alternatives that are for sure. Uh, I think the American people deserve us to go for a for sure outcome of, of electricity uh, that we could spend the same amount of money on rather than something that could work because the computer models tell us so. Uh, and uh, Dr. McGo, go right ahead. I know you're anxious to refute that or say something good about it. Go, please <laughs> use my time to do that. And the head of ITER, who was this uh, Dr. Bigo, well, he said this. Is why with ITER, we need a larger, okay, tokamak, we need a larger vacuum vessel, and the expectation is to have 10 times fusion power that we will feed in with the heating system. He said to an official inquiry that ITER is going to make 10 times more power than they put in. He's technically correct that they will get 10 times more energy out of the plasma compared to how much they got in, but they're certainly not going to get energy out of it. And I think that Congressman Rowan Barker, well, I reckon he had the wool pulled over his eyes, even though he was clearly a little bit sceptical. So what do you reckon? Comments. Did he mislead or did he do it deliberately? Fact is that when ITER is plugged into the French electrical system, it's not going to be making any power. 
Now, you might think that I'm against spending $50 billion on ITER and fusion power, but I, I'm not. Will it be a colossal waste of money? Probably, actually. But what a wonderful waste of money. This is sort of the Mona Lisa of science. you just got to do it. It's not like the Mona Lisa makes anything. Governments waste far more than this doing things which don't produce anything or actually are actively damaging. This won't damage anything. I'm a little reminded of George Mallory, who died trying to be the first to climb Mount Everest, which is the most pointless thing that you could think of in many ways. When asked that why he did that, he said, because it's there. But I have misgivings about the abuse of science and misleading governments by institutions who are just trying to get funding. It's bad for science in the long run, and maybe there are better ways of spending the $50 billion. So what do you think? If you were the head of ITER, like Mr. Big O, would you manipulate the statistics and tell half-truths to get funding? Do you think you would do the right and honourable thing? Really? Remember, you have thousands of people in your organisations relying on you for their job for the next decade. Many of them you might know very well. They've got children in school. They have mortgages. Maybe just a little lie by mission. Maybe a little lie that you can claim later was a terrible misunderstanding because actually what you said was technically correct. Can you see why we need professional scientific auditors, not Congressman Rowan Barker? We need professional auditors to hold these heads of scientific institutions to account. Dr. Big O was essentially doing his job, which is trying to keep ITO going. So I've been pushing for a long time for proper scientific audits of any public policy decisions that are using science. Mr. Big O is actually the last person you should ask for a completely straight answer. And people like Congressman Rowan Barker are easy to fool, even though they could clearly smell a rat. So we need science auditors so it's easier to distinguish the brilliant science from maybe not the broken science, but maybe a little bit of broken communication.